Okay, so let's start our seminar, right? So it's my great pleasure to introduce Li Liu from uh, Beijing International Center of Mathematical Research, Peking University, who is going to talk about finite volume hyperbolic three manifolds uh, almost determined by the finite uh, quotient groups. Please go ahead. Thanks a lot for the introduction and uh, thanks for um, arranging this second talk because I missed the first one. Uh, okay, so um, what I wanted to talk about is this uh, final final one of Humboldt's three manifolds and uh, their final quotient groups. Um, I realized this is a uh, algebraic uh, seminar. So um, I guess for the algebraic part, I'll try to um, say it um, more briefly and uh, and uh, I since I'm mostly doing three manifold uh, topology, so I I also review some uh, facts in three manifold topology, and uh, and, and hopefully we can um, get on the same page. Okay. Um. So, um. Actually, there are many ways to introduce these profinite um uh, groups and profinite completions. Um. There, are, there is a typical algebraic way, and uh, when I give topological to uh, um, talks, I like to introduce in the uh, uh, with a story about three manifold groups. So, um, so I, I will, I will usually say that okay, for um, for example, in, in three manifold topology, you when, when you want to classify three manifold groups, um, I mean. You can classify them up to topology, and you can also classify their fundamental groups. Um, and uh, there is a naive algorithm for doing this. Um, you can do it on one hand, on um, trying to uh, list all the possible uh, isomorphisms, just trying to construct all the homomorphisms one by one and check if it is an isomorphism. And uh, on the other hand, you can try to list all the finite uh, groups and trying to construct the epimorphisms of the group onto the uh, onto the given finite group. And uh, for example, if, if on uh, at some point you find that pi a suggests one uh, finite group, uh, which pi b does not suggest uh, suggest, then uh, you can tell they are different. Mm, so uh, I put this uh, uh, algorithm in a code quotation mark um, because you can easily see that there is a gap between these two. Um, this would actually, um, actually one of these uh, uh, procedures would terminate if and only if um, for every three manifold groups, uh, uh, it is totally determined by the collection of its final quotients. Of course, we know that's uh, related to profinite completions. Um, and uh, what I want to mention uh, in the case of three mental groups is that there are some uh, well-known counterexamples of this uh, uh, unique unit determination. Um, the, the, there are some torus bond over circle examples given by Steep, uh, and uh, there are some other uh, surface bond over circle um, examples given by Hempel um, in a later construction. Um, okay. Um, so regarding three manifold groups, I would like to um, say a little more about terminology. Um, so when I say three manifold group, I usually mean that some groups that are isomorphic to the fundamental group uh, of a three manifold. Um, and uh, I also say finite generated three manifold groups. And uh, there is some, um, some theorem in Scott's theorem in three manifold topology saying that it's uh, three manifold groups are so-called coherent. That means um, for any finite generated three manifold group, you can always represent it as a fundamental group of, of some compact three manifold. Um, so in particular, you can show that three manifold groups are always finite presented. There are some other theorem tells you that these groups are always residually finite. So these are really nice groups for considering profinite completions. And uh, another thing about three-manifold topology 
uh, that that's, um, well, you might think, um, you might try to think of some examples of three manifolds uh, and there are some length spaces which have the same fundamental group, but which are not homeomorphic. And that seems to be a little bothering because the uh, topology is, um, is not exactly the same as the isomorphism type of their uh, fundamental group. But actually that, that case is quite exceptional. So in most cases, you, you should believe that three manifold groups are topologically mostly, I mean, largely determined by their fundamental groups. And uh, for some particular example, um, if the, uh, well, if your group is freely indecomposable and infinite, then, uh, and suppose this is a three manifold group of a closed three manifold, um, then you can topologically characterize that a, a spherical and the prime. And, and it also has this topological rigidity, which means it, the homeomorphism type is completely determined. So, mm, so in some, under some very reasonable um, assumptions, then this, this is just, uh, um, you, you can take uh, the fundamental group to be most of the information about the topology. Okay, so these are just some remarks about three meaningful groups. Let's come back to uh, profinite group completion. Mm. When you have a finitely generated residually finite group, then there are some different formulations of this concept. One is that you take all the finite quotients of your given group all together um, as a set, which is sometimes you know, uh, called a group genus, meaning type of the group. And, uh, and uh, there is a, another um, more organized uh, construction. You can take the uh, inverse limit of all the finite quotients and, and obtain this so-called um, profinite group completion. It seems that um, the second one is more, um, it's fancier than the, fat, than the first one, but it turns out these two um, contains essentially uh, the same amount of information uh, when you have two um, groups of the same genus, I mean, under finite generated residually finite assumption, to saying that their uh, profinite completions are isomorphic. Um, and and uh, when you want to talk about to pick yourself to a certain class of groups, it might be smaller than the class of finitely generated residually finite groups. And uh, mm, for example, we're interested in finite generated three meaningful groups, and uh, it has a lot of Nicer, I will mention. You get finite completion determines the isomorphism type of the group uniquely, um, and uh, if you slightly generalize uh, this notion, uh, you can introduce what we call profinite almost rigidity, which means the profinite completion determines the group up to finitely many possibilities. Okay, so we have two different kinds of notion. It seems that the first notion, profinite rigidity as more desirable, but uh, at least in the world of three meaningful groups, I guess the second condition is more common as we will see, okay? Mm. So uh, when you want to, uh, in general, when you want to uh, study the profound completion of a, uh, of a group or those problem related to profound completions, uh, in some sense, you're passing from the group level to the uh, profinite completion level. So um, supposedly you might um, lose some information and, uh, and, and you keep, mm, and some properties are kept during this um, procedure. So, mm, so for those properties that are kept when you pass to the um, profinite completion, those properties are called mm, profinite properties, or at least some of them as our example. Uh, there are some obvious ones, like for abstract groups, you can talk about um, the abelianization, talk about the rank and their torsion size. 
those are um, for finite invariance and uh, and uh, whether or not your group is a finite group that's of course um, providing a property and the virtual solvability that's also um, and if you translate it into uh, uh, terms of three meaningful groups the first one corresponds to the uh, spherical geometric ones and the um, the second class in, in includes those Euclidean or neo or so geometric uh, ones uh, in, in the list of certain eight geometries. Mm. Okay, and uh, uh, I also list some more properties that are more topological. There is this uh, geometric decomposition of three manifold groups, which says that every three prime three manifold group can be decomposed into pieces which are geometric, um, usually hyperbolic or cipher fiber. Um, and and uh, uh, um, uh, what in uh, the less decomposite geometric type of the vertices are um, a profound property. Um, uh, and uh, um, whether or not your manifold fibers over the circle as a surface bundle, that is also a profound property. Uh, and this is uh, mm, earlier proved by Boileau and uh, uh, Friedo under some uh, ass proof assumption. And uh, actually, his, uh, we'll, we'll go into some points of his proof uh, in this talk, and it inspires some aspects of the result I want to talk about. Mm. And also, um, also, uh, whether or not your manifold admits uh, non-positively curved uh, Riemannian metric, that is also, uh, turns out that it's also a property. Mm. And uh, that actually follows from the um, previous um, result of Wilton Zaleski about the geometric pattern, if there's a hyperbolic piece. And in a case when there are no hyperbolic piece, um, basically, um, uh, Wilkes gave some um, almost a classification for profile property, uh, profile completion of uh, graph manifolds uh, in that case. And uh, actually, he wrote uh, two papers, and the second paper gave a almost uh, complete classification, and that tells you even in the case of graph manifolds. This uh, non-positive curvature condition turns out to be a profinite um, group theoretic condition. Okay, and uh, there are some uh, some other algebraic invariants um, that turns out to be profinite property. Um, one of uh, if you restrict to not groups, um, Wilkie proved that the Alexander polynomial is a profinite property. Um, and, and uh, I guess uh, there are some way to, I'll use some ingredients of his work to deal with twisted algorithm polynomials for certain three manifold groups. Okay, so um, the fact, uh, you, you don't have to go into details for facts in this page. And the, basically on um, this uh, examples tells you that, um, there are profinite rigidity phenomenon and the profinite non-rigidity um, with some examples. And, uh, and, and the last few examples tells you that uh, basically um, for all the known examples in the world of three main faults, um, they, um, even if they do not satisfy profinite rigidity, they always satisfy profinite almost rigidity. These examples include Horace examples started from um, steep and, and then Huna give a more complete uh, description and the graph manifolds. Uh, in that case, it is uh, basically done by Wilkes. And, and there are some other examples of um, arithmetic lattices in higher rank Lie groups um, proved by Aka. And, and then uh, in his uh, and his or her uh, proof. Um, it, it, it's also, um, you, you also see profinite almost rigidity phenomenon in that case, okay? Um, 
And uh, um, so the main results that I want to talk about uh, in this talk is uh, this uh, for finite gen, uh, finite volume hyperbolic three manifolds, um, you can prove profinite almost rigidity. And of course, um, because of the earlier um, profinite determination of the geometric decomposition, you can you can say that uh, this is a result in the world of three uh, finitely generated three manifold groups. Okay, um, and. Uh, and as I said, when you want to study the profile and completion of some groups, essentially, um, mm, I, I mean, a good strategy is that you look for those uh, profile properties. There are some known ones. And uh, for this result, um, the, the new properties that we identify as profile invariants are the certain norm and the fiber cone structures on the first cohomology. So I guess if you knew some three manifold topology, this uh, statement um, is a little weak because it um, skips some details. And uh, to be precise, actually I'll, I'll review on uh, certain norm and the fiber cones later in this talk. So you don't have to worry about it at this point. Um, but basically if you knew, if, if you knew how these are defined, these are some structures on the first cohomology. And basically um, the complete version for this theorem should say that um, whenever you get a profile isomorphism between two groups, which are fundamental groups of finite volume hyperbolic three manifolds, um, then whenever you have a profile isomorphism like this, then, um, then it induces some um, profile isomorphism on the uh, completion of the first integral homology or cohomology. Um, and it then turns out that you, you can find some um, linear isomorphism on the, actually the, the first the integral cohomology. And, and, uh, mm, and uh, with respect to that linear isomorphism, um, you, you can say that the certain norm and the fiber cones are preserved under that isomorphism. So we'll go into uh, this uh, later. Um, well, come back to the statement. Um, mm, I mean, uh, it's not obviously at this point how the second theorem implies the first one, but um, actually the second theorem is uh, uh, mm, the mm, almost the the first, the biggest step towards the second theorem, uh, towards the main theorem. So I guess uh, as, uh, for the rest of the talk, I'll focus on the, um, the profile invariance of source norm. I review some concepts related to it. Um, and uh, for the first theorem about the um, profile almost rigidity, it follows from the um, second theorem um, basically from the following um, argument. So uh, the, uh, the second theorem basically tells you that you can match up the, the, the fiber surfaces all together. And then, uh, then you can, mm, uh, well, you can pass the final cover and match up the fiber surfaces. And then, mm, then uh, the essential problem translates into a uh, profanity invariance about the mapping class groups. And there are some ways to identify the twisted Alexander polynomials and further to identify the Nielsen um, number um, of the monodromy. And, and after that, you can basically um, identify the dilatation of those uh, pseudo of mapping classes. Uh, and, and, and in that way, you can, um, you can show the finiteness. Um, but uh, this is uh, some, uh, this, these techniques are somewhat related to a, a former work of mine regarding mapping class and the profinite congruent conjugacy. That's an analogous version for profinite rigidity in mapping class world. Um, and, uh, um, and, and for some technical reason, um, um, to go from the second theorem to the first theorem, you, you need some extra ingredients uh, of 
uh, daily free than the dream work regarding um, cyclic resultants of a uh, reciprocal polynomials. But those um, I, I'll not, because of the um, limited time, I, I want to go into details for that part. And I'll just focus on the invariance of the uh, third norm because uh, it, it's somewhat more topological and uh, and uh, there are some nice, uh, I guess, some interesting ideas come from topology and it goes into the uh, algebraic world. So that's uh, basically the plan for the rest part of this uh, talk. Mm, okay, so mm, so let's uh, um, start with this uh, problem itself. Uh, let's say you want to show that um, you're, let's say you're given two groups, pi A and pi B, which are uh, fundamental groups so three manifolds. And suppose that you have a iso profound isomorphism psi um, between the completions. Um, then, uh, um, then for each of the group, finalization modulo torsion, represented that as a first homology, and then um, by choosing some basis, you can identify this group as d to the r for some same rank. Um, and uh, mm, and then the basic problem is that um, suppose you want to um, prove some result about this, uh, as I said, uh, about certain norm, uh, you'd better have an isomorphism on the actual integral homology level. Mm, but uh, basically, when you have this uh, psi, what you have is an induced isomorphism on the profinite completion. And uh, with respect to some basis, you can represent it, represent this psi star mm, as a matrix on R by R matrix, um, but with entries in the hat. Um, of course, um, what we wanted is that uh, we'd better have some matrix um, that lies in GLRZ uh, rather than GLZRZ hat, okay? So there is some problem that we need to address. Mm. Um, and it uh, turns out um, in the world, uh, when you restrict to fundamental group of uh, hyperbolic three manifolds of finite volume, um, Mm, the situation is better uh, because what we can prove is, uh, um, is that the, actually the induced uh, isomorphism would take a more special for it. We, let's introduce this uh, terminology. We see that psi is uh, so-called z hat times regular. Um, if your matrix, um, it is a matrix with entries in uh, the hat, but it can be decomposed into mu times f, where mu is uh, invertible elements in the profinite numbers, and the f is an integral matrix. Um, and you can easily see that suppose your psi satisfy condition in this way, then mu f and a net minus mu minus f, that's the only two ways to, uh, uh, to decompose this psi star uh, into a form like this. Okay, so um, so if you're um, if, if you're given some uh, profound isomorphism between completion of three manifold groups and your psi satisfies this condition, um, then um, you can you can obtain some isomorphism within the presented by the integral f. It will be some isomorphism at this bit, some isomorphism determined up to plus or minus one. Um, and uh, if you're talking about the source and norm, uh, those properties are symmetric of, uh, about this uh, um, and the zinable. Okay. So, uh, so as what, what I said, um, essentially, if you want to make um, precise of the second result regarding source norm, then um, then this is actually the um, uh, the the important result.
towards showing it. Um, it turns out that for finite volume hyperbolic three manifolds, um, your isomorphism takes a very special form that is uh, the z hat times regular regularity. Mm. Yeah, I guess for the rest of the talk, because this, uh, this z hat times seems a little hard to read out. I'll usually say generalized regularity or exotic regularity, some terms like that. Okay, um, and then let's come back to the uh, to your results um, that I mentioned before. Actually, Boileau and uh, Friedel showed. Remember, I mentioned that Boileau and uh, Friedel showed the uh, invariance of twisted algorithm polynomials in the case of fiber three manifolds, um, and uh, there they introduced the condition called. Uh, regular, they say that psi is regular if psi is actually due so that that's equivalent. You can you could show theorem saying that whenever you have an isomorphism like this, that is necessarily uh, regular. Um, then in that case, the, the second theorem, main theorem I mentioned before, um, would be naturally followed from Boileau and uh, Fredo. But the problem is that um, regularity seems to be something very hard to be shown. I don't know how to show it, and I don't know a, a counter example to that. Um, but what we can do is that we can show this exotic regularity, and that suffices for our purpose. Okay. So I guess with these explanations, um, uh, the, the, the main task that uh, for this whole proof is that we want to, um, uh, we will want to prove this uh, exotic regularity. And uh, um, next I'll explain some key steps towards what it's proved. Mm. Okay, so I guess we need to review some point, uh, uh, review this uh, certain norm. Mm, that's a concept in three manifold topology. Um, so mm, suppose you're given a three manifold, and you can assume uh, orientable and uh, closed and nice conditions on it. And basically the certain norm is a, uh, is a norm on the uh, first cohomology uh, with real coefficients. And uh, basically it, it, it comes from a norm that with Z coefficients, whenever you have a Z coefficient homology class by Pankaj duality, it is due to, um, due to a, a second homology class and you can represent it as an embedded oriented surface. And you try to, uh, if you try to minimize the so-called complexity of this, uh, um, uh, of the dual surface, then you get this uh, uh, this quantity called the certain norm. Um, I mean, it turns out that this uh, this is a norm, and, and that follows from certain um, three main topological trick. Um, and then, um, and, and then, um, dually, um, because you have a norm on the first. Cohomology whole norm on the first in this talk we'll consider these two kinds of norms together because um, although the first one the certain norm is our, uh, a very useful one it's related to for example Newton polygons of Alexander polynomials and stuff like that. Okay, so I'll try to um, draw some pictures and show how those two things are related together. And there is another remark. If you think about general uh, three manifolds, which are not hyperbolic three manifolds, um, it, it is possible that um, the cohomology class is due to some surface with, um, with complexity zero. For example, it's due to some uh, spheres and the tori. Um, and in that case, the, the norm could be degenerate. But in the case of hyperbolic three manifolds, the norm is 
actually a non-degenerate norm. Um, and the upshot is that if you look at the unit form of the norm, it's necessarily a, a, a polygon, a, a, a polytope of, um, of co-dimension zero. Uh, it's not degenerate. Um, and, the, uh, and moreover, um, mm, there are some other topological restraint uh, constraints on the, uh, th that um, I don't know, you, you, you can see some features in, 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 this, uh, in this picture. I'm drawing a random picture of example of certain um, unit ball and it's dual. So, uh, so for this talk, whenever you see a green polytope, I usually mean that this polytope is on the cohomology and a dually I'll draw the um, unit ball uh, with a red color. Mm. And uh, uh, and you you can see some features in this picture. For example, um, you can see that certain norm ball uh, is central symmetric if if you apply minus one. This uh, this ball is invariant, and similarly here it's invariant. And uh, and uh, there are some properties as I listed here. Um, the certain norm ball takes integral values on, on the integral homology. So dually, um, turns out the, the dual certain, mm, I mean, yeah, uh, turns out the dual certain norm polytope will have vertices at the integral lattices. So uh, it, it also makes it easier to work with. And then there is another notion of so-called fibered classes. Mm, suppose, uh, remember every, Phi, suppose your phi is, is a cohomology class inside here, um, then it can be represented by Punker duality by some um, embedded surface. And suppose this surface is a fiber surface of some surface bundle over circle, then in that case, we, we say that phi is a fibered class. Um, and uh, what Thurston proved in his original article uh, is that Mm. If phi is a mm, fibered class, um, then necessarily it lies in some open cone um, of the certain norm ball, and it turns out um, turns out that every integral lattice in the same open cone um, is necessarily fibered. Um, and then, so, so in that way, um, whenever you see a fibered class, uh, you also must see some so-called fibered cones with respect to the first norm. Um, so I'm drawing some more pictures to, uh, to show what, I'm, what, what I said. Um, for example, here, um, this is another picture, another random picture. I can't draw three-dimensional pictures. Uh, so I, I just draw two-dimensional ones to illustrate. That's another random example. Uh, notice here, these are the integral vertices on the dual picture. Uh, and the, here's a picture for illustration of uh, fibered cones. Um, so in this picture, I'm seeing that th this green cones on, on are, um, it could be some fibered cones of some hyperbolic three manifolds. And in this case, every integral lattice inside he point inside here uh, is a fibered class. And a dually, um, mm, dually, because this is a uh, Every fiber cone is over some co um, top dimensional face. So dually you see some vertices. Mm -hmm. So in a dual picture, fiber cones correspond to certain uh, vertices that are usually marked uh, in this way as shown. Okay, here's some, that's some picture. Okay, so uh, let's come back to the, um, to, to the uh, essential issue as we said, we were trying to, um, uh, we were trying to show this exotic uh, regularity, and the idea actually um, goes back to, to Jacob's appearance work. Um, suppose just randomly uh, that you have some um, induced isomorphism on the completion of the torsion-free first homology. Um, then um, 
then suppose in general that you don't know if your uh, uh, if this psi star uh, is uh, exotically regular or not, then in general you can only de decompose that it as a linear combination this way, where alpha i are some profile integers and the phi i are some integral matrices. Mm. And if you want to show this uh, um, exotic regularity, then that's equivalent to showing that if you decompose uh, minimally in this way, you can achieve s equals one. Mm. Okay, uh, at this, we don't know if psi satisfy this extra condition. So uh, in general, we have a, this uh, general form of a linear decomposition. Um, what uh, you can, the theorem proved is something, you, you can interpret it, uh, his proof in something like this. And so what he did is that um, uh, in general, you start with some decomposition in this way, uh, and that is uh, a priori not an uh, integral um, homomorphism, and uh, mm, you want to try anyways to create some integral homomorphism. So uh, one way you can do is that you can uh, decompose it minimally in this way and replace every alpha i with some other integer. You know, you have some uh, flexibility for, for choosing this ci, um, but uh, anyways, you, uh, if you cho choose it generically, you will obtain some, mm, some integral homomorphism that is not necessarily invertible, but uh, in generic means it's injective. Okay, um, and, uh, and what Jenkins' appearance shows is some, mm, uh, I guess, some results um, in this way. He shows that uh, if you just randomly choose in CI uh, in this way, uh, and uh, suppose um, suppose your your pi b is a fiber with a fiber class. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, suppose uh, you have some cohomology class uh, of pi b, and if under the under the you can say deform uh, star, then suppose this cohomology class goes to some fiber class, then you can tell that the cohomology class itself is fiber Jenkins appearance holes. It turns out this, what he showed is actually that uh, for generic perturbation, perturbation um, psi star C, then if you look at the pre-image of any fiber cone, it is necessarily contained uh, in some fiber cone of pi A. And it could be the case that the pre-image is empty set and uh, you, you get a trivial implication in that case. Okay, so this is basically what he said, uh, what he proved. And, and uh, we can try to reformulate his, uh, his uh, approach um, with some extra notations. So suppose you have some isomorphism in this way and uh, it induces uh, a profinite homomorphism in, and uh, if you fix some basis of H A and H B, then you get square matrix as before. And then, uh, if, if we want to abstractify what he proved, uh, then we can introduce some um, some sub module of uh, the hat that is generated by all the entries of the square matrix psi star. And and then um, basically, um, um, basically uh, what um, you construct with that C or CI before um, as, uh, as a homomorphism obtained um, by uh, this uh, psi star, you can think of it as some matrix with entries in this uh, matrix coefficient module. And uh, whenever you, um, you, you take a homomorphism of efficient, you can construct a similarly uh, Mm, a homomorphism the, um, uh, in this way, and it's still non-degenerate for generic alpha. So if you compare with the uh, previous 
um, construction, what we um, generalize is only that um, alpha are some homomorphic, not only with uh, uh, integral uh, values, but we can also allow it to have uh, real values. Okay, and uh, basically, uh, uh, if you follow Jenkins' appearance argument, you can show that for this generalized deformation, uh, generalized deformations, um, psi star alpha of psi star, and um, then um, then you can still show that the pre-image of any fiber cone is contained in the fiber cone, and uh, and also we observe that. Um, remember our. Uh, our Ultimate goal is to shake out the regularity, and the, the goal turns out to you can reduce the goal to be showing that the matrix coefficient module has rank one corresponding to the number s to be one. Okay, so this is uh, basically a summary of taking the appearance approach and a, a reformulation um, for our discussion. Mm. Okay, so uh, our goal is now clear uh, that we want to set up, uh, um, set up actually a correspondence between the certain norm cones and the certain norm balls. Um, and, and uh, but if you think about it, um, what the weak correspondence, weak fiber cone correspondence Correspondence tells you in the uh, it's just a weak partial correspondence between the fiber cones, and uh, if you want to um, promote this result to a general result, there are some a priori questions. Uh, for example, what if pi b has no fiber cones at all? Then what 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 can you do? And a second, um, it only talks about the these fiber cones. What if uh, what about this? The non fiber with that show the now, let, let's say you can show the correspondence between certain non cones. Does it necessarily imply that there is the isomorphism between certain non unit balls? Um, and if not, if that's not the case, then what else do we need? Okay. So uh, I like to show you some pictures for uh, illustrating uh, the issues I mentioned. As I said, um, uh, um, the perturbation argument only tells you that the pre-image of fiber cone is a uh, uh, is containing the fiber cone. So you can imagine that um, this uh, uh, hexagon is a pre-image of a certain norm um, unit ball, uh, and and uh, this is. Uh, uh, the in the coordinates of comparison, um, and then uh, the black uh, faces are are the fiber cones. In in this picture, you, you can see that in some cases the fiber cone can be a pre image fiber cone can be contained entirely in the fiber cone, but uh, you don't have um, isomorphism between the um, between the polytopes. Um, so that is some issue that you want to, uh, uh, some possibility that you want to exclude. Um, and uh, here's another even more variable picture. Um, so in this picture, you can see that there, you, you, you can um, come up with um, configurations of polytope that in, in some cases, it, it, it could be the case that all the uh, faces are fibered and all the faces uh, all, all the fiber cones are contained in fiber cones. And even uh, in some picture like this, you don't have a uh, isomorphism between the certain norm. So that's related to the third qu question I mentioned. Even if you have a correspondence between the uh, fiber cones, you don't necessarily or automatically have an isomorphism between the, um, between the certain norm both. So, so if you want to prove the uh, theorem, you need some, mm, you, uh, you, you need to look for some extra um, argument. Okay, so uh, I guess I'll, mm, I'll quickly explain how we 
deal well, how you can deal with the first two questions that's uh, easier to deal with. Basically, the reason is that uh, uh, the the trick here is that you you have this uh, virtual quasi fibering trick, and it's related to the um, the proof of virtual Hawking conjecture. There is a strong form that tells you that whenever you have a hyperbolic three manifold with let's say hyperbolic and the uh, uh, oriental cusp, then um, then you can always find some finite cover so that uh, for any cohomology class, you can make sure that on the finite cover, it lies on the boundary uh, of some fibered cone. Mm. And uh, the, the, uh, the description here seems a little um, hard to imagine if you first time see it. Here's some picture. So, uh, so the relation between the um, the relation between the finite cover is that whenever you have a finite cover, uh, I mean a, a covering space over a given manifold, um, then the cohomology of the um, manifold downstairs embeds upstairs, and uh, the on, on the homology level you have a map going from um, up to the bottom. Um, okay. And, and what the theorem says is that um, even if um, on the cohomology, you even if in some cases you don't have any fiber class, then uh, then you can always in a three manifold world you can always construct and find a cover so that um, uh, so that on, on the uh, when when you pull it pull any uh, cohomology class back to the finite cover, it lies on the boundary of some uh, some fibered cone that shows up um, there. Um, and the dually, this is a dual picture that you might see. Um, that is, uh, um, sometimes you, you, you don't have anything downstairs, but you can upstairs and create some um, fibered vertex and project it into, um, into the picture downstairs. Okay. Um, so, um, so basically, I, I guess I can um, quickly uh, sketch the proof for solving the first problem. That is, uh, um, so suppose you have a profile isomorphism like this, then what you do is that you construct a pair of corresponding regular finite cover, make sure that all the classes are uh, quasi-fibered up, upstairs. And then um, because the, um, the um, uh, on, on the top, you can apply this uh, partial uh, or the weak correspondence, and you can identify the cohomology uh, of the manifold downstairs uh, as the uh, invariant part under the deck transformation. So then these two information, uh, two pieces of information can be combined and uh, helps you to um, get um, proof that all the top dimensional faces downstairs uh, should or top dimensional cones downstairs should correspond to each other, and and whenever um, once you have these top dimensional faces to uh, match up together, then um, the lower dimensional faces can be proved by using intersections between each other. Okay, so um, the last issue is something like this that uh, um, I guess I don't have time to explain, but basically what you need to do is that you want to uh, find some extra uh, rays that uh, corresponds to each other. And again, uh, this race came from certain, um, certain rays going through vertices um, by passing to some suitable finite cover. And that is related to an earlier result of mine, um, uh, improving a, a conjecture of uh, Mark Mullen uh, that says that when, uh, whenever you have a pseudonymous of automorphism, you can find some finite cover so that the, uh, uh, the, it has a homological eigenvalue, um, which is greater than one in, in, in absolute value. And in that construction, we um, basically we find some ways to construct uh, finite covers so that the certain norm uniball gets more complicated, gets some uh, extra uh, vertex uh, vertex that projects uh, 
project to the interior of uh, fiber cone downstairs. So with that construction, um, you can uh, you can solve the third problem as I mentioned. But I'll just um, skip um, this part. And and uh, for the last of my talk, uh, I'll mention some uh, question. Mm. So there are some other interesting properties uh, that we don't know if that's determined by the profile and completion, notably the uh, in first three meaningful groups, uh, the conventional ability class and the simplicial volume, roughly the hyperbolic volume and the chirality, whether or not your manifold admits uh, orientation preserving, mm, no, orientation reversing self automorphism. Okay, and uh, here's another question regarding to the factor mu, as I mentioned, I don't know uh, how to construct um, those uh, exotic examples with mu other than plus or minus one. Um, I don't know if those examples exist, so I'll leave it as a question. And I guess that's end of my talk. Thank you very much, especially that we have difference 11 hours, so it is two o'clock in the morning uh, for you. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's uh, everybody uh, let's thank speaker, right? I'm mute microphone, so let's thank speaker for the talk. And I open a question session. I mean, anybody wants to find question or wants to ask question can unmute microphone and try to ask. I, I have one question. Yeah. Please. Uh, so, uh, so your theory about this uh, regularity so shows that uh, uh, if you look at uh, the automorphism group of the um, profiling completion of three of hyperbolic three manifold group, yes. so it puts uh, this. There puts uh, a strong restriction. So, mm -hmm. do you know any other restriction of this kind? Um, you okay, mean other. So, for example, do you know? Okay, okay. Uh, is it countable? This group? Can you? Uh, can you? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Use you, for example. You, mean... you you can you ask whether this uh, constant can be. Yeah different from one but uh, for uh -huh. example you can also ask whether this group is countable or something like this mm -hmm. yeah, so i so if a and b are the same so i am speaking about the case when uh -huh. uh, uh, psi is an automorphism group mm -hmm. as out of so um uh, yeah i yeah, I also thought okay, about this. Uh, maybe okay, uh, uh, out uh, out. Of course, you look. You have yeah. to look out, not out of but. Yeah. yeah, I also thought you about look. some like uh, like pro finite version of most rigidity or or the finiteness of outer automorphism group for pro uh -huh. finite completion. Uh, so you, yeah, uh, mm, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I thought uh, as. I can even tell for finite volume hyperbolic three manifold. I can even tell whether this group is finite or not. So, but uh, just if you take okay, I don't know. Maybe in some example, can you prove it uh, if you do? Um, um, I I don't know. Even in the in, even in the case of uh, um, you know, there's this result of. Uh, Brisson, Mike Reynolds, and Ray, and the speech were about this uh, absolute yeah. um, profile rigidity. And in, in even for examples of those lattices, I don't know if the okay. outer automorphism is finite or not. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would certainly guess that's uh, finite or even the same as the. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 yeah, see. but I don't know how to, how to prove that. Um, and for this mu, I think uh, for hyperbolic manifold, what I can prove now is that mm, you, you, you can prove mu square equals one, which means that uh, um, 
you know, mu is a non finite integer. So it's, uh, you can write a direct product of, uh, of factors in Zp. And that means that for each Zp factor, that's plus or minus one, but you don't know the distribution, which ones are plus one, which one is negative one. Uh, okay, so it, it, this is a new result. Um, new yes, one, or if... Yeah, I'm writing down some. Uh, okay. 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 Thank you. Any more questions? Well, maybe I, I can uh, come back to that question we discussed a month ago. Uh, mm. that when we have uh, this uh, three manifold, and therefore we have this uh, first in the composition into, and therefore we represent it as a graph of groups, right? All uh, right, then a uh, combination of your theorem and uh, our theorems, all uh, right, shows that uh, the graphs, underlying graphs will be the same and vertex and age groups will be the same, but the embeddance of age groups and uh, to, to vertex groups might be not the same and uh, whether we can estimate there are only finitely many embeddance uh, uh, by finding uh, that graphs of groups can be uh, different only for up to finitely many such embeddings when we have isomorphisms of profile isomorphism of profinite completions. Uh, you, I don't know whether you thought about this during this month or have new uh, information. Mm. Yeah, I, I think, for example, in the case when, when you have a uh, three man, let's say you have a three man which has only two hyperbolic pieces gluing along a vertex, and and in that case i think you have on um, you have pretty strong on um, rigidity because basically on um, what you can show is that you can pass to finite power and make sure that um, the uh, the edge group um, is com completely visible when you pass to homology which means that the edge group is uh, embedded into first homology and and in that case i think your uh, result together this Together with uh, uh, regularity can be applied because the, both the adjacent pieces are hyperbolic, so you can apply the regularity mm -hmm. on both pieces, and then then for those uh, edges you can uh, you can show that in, in some sense the gluing is rigid. Uh, and if you have an extension of the soap, um, um, I think that's uh, yeah, actually an extension. I think the essential problem, uh, essential um, obstruction is that uh, basically for edges that are adjacent to hyperbolic pieces, mm -hmm. um, it could be hyperbolic adjacent to back to itself. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, so once you have an problem, edge group. Problem then cipher manifolds or what is, where the problem are? Um, yeah, the problem is with the cipher pieces because you have this, uh, uh, you, you have certain um, flexibility with the cipher pieces, and uh, there is, um, you, you know, if we go into um, detail of um, the works uh, of works proof uh, classification of the graph manifold case, I think there are some exotic factors similar to this mu in the graph manifold case, and and uh, I think they require some extra analysis to see if they match up together. <laughs> so. So that's something I'm not sure at this point. Mm. Uh -huh. And uh, another question of different nature. Uh, uh, can you, by your method, just somewhat separate those uh, three manifolds that has genu uh, that uh, are prof uh, profoundly rigid instead of almost profoundly rigid? So it's a sort of sub subclass or examples of three manifolds which are profoundly rigid. Um, Profinite rigid examples. I think um, the only known examples are in are, are these ones that I mentioned. The the, the ones punctured torus bundles and and the Wicks manifold. Uh -huh. That is the orientable closed hyperbolic manifold of smallest volume. And uh, um, and uh, yeah, I think what uh, what they show is that the first on um, trying to um, use the uh, the character variety because they have um, very few um, representation in to see 
and and index subgroups, then you they, they can show profound rigidity. And then, and actually they show pretty strong result, which is uh, profound rigidity uh, among the residual finite finite generated groups. So what they call the absolute profound rigidity. So um, that, that's the only examples I know of it. Oh, there are some other examples as Wilkes showed that for every graph manifold, you can find some finite cover that is profinitely rigid. But so it's not very nice uh, result. Hyper, it is not hyperbolic then. Yeah. And talking about hyperbolic. Uh, but for hyperbolic ones, I don't. Uh -huh. For hyperbolic ones, I, I don't know other examples. I see. Then and, like the, the and this, uh, I mean, suppose you're given hyperbolic three manifold, right? And uh, by your theorem, we know that uh, we have only finitely many isomorphism class, so finitely yes. many manifolds such as uh, profile completion mm -hmm. is the same. Can we actually estimate, estimate or sort of uh, compute this number, this finite number? Um, um, let's see. Uh, I think in principle, um, I mean, this number is essentially given by um, given by the when when you have a pseudo anos of automorphism of a surface, then uh, then it shows that uh, uh, when you when you have a pseudo anos of map of a surface with a given dilatation a stretching factor, then um, then that number will um, will give an upper bound of the the number of possible manifolds, and that number is basically um, uh, well, basically you count, you, you can count the number of geodesics on the, um, on the moduli space of genus G surface and uh, count how many, uh, how many geodesics have a given in L and that's, uh, that's uh, an upper, upper bound for the, the finiteness. But uh, um, I don't know how to make it directly related to the group theoretic information because uh, you need to sort of given a hyperbolic mean for the you you need to know um, to what finite cover you can get fiber um, condition and and uh, you need to estimate the dilatation on the finite cover i think that's the ineffective part so roughly speaking um there are, if you're given a concrete manifold i think you can give an up, upper bound but uh, um, there is no general formula. Possibly upper bounds uh, overall not doesn't exist or, or, because your theorem says only that mm -hmm. every every every. Uh, I think there's a there there are no um, um, no upper bound or no effective upper bound mm -hmm. um, up to now. But if you're given a concrete hyperbolic manifold, I think there are some algorithm that eventually tells you a number. That is the upper bound. <laughs> nice. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Can I make observation? Sure. sure. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I work with something called sigma theory, and there is invariance due to Berian's treble that were generalized later on by Newman. And this mm -hmm. is somehow related with the Thurston norm in the case of a uh, hyperbolic groups, like mm -hmm. three manifold groups. Mm. But I actually, sigma theory studies maps from a finitely generated group to the reals. Mm. And because you're in a very special kind of setting with three hyperbolic group, that you mm. have you have a coherent group and you have a, a lot of structure, mm. right? In general, mm. when you do just group theory, mm. and then you can ask, for which maps, for example, the kernel is finitely generated. Mm -hmm. And there is a theory developed by those guys, Beery, Strebel, and Newman, which is actually mm -hmm. paper in Inventionis, that tells mm -hmm. you that the kernel is finitely generated if and only if the two antipodal maps that corresponds to this kernel are in the sigma one invariant. Mm -hmm. Okay. And actually, there is a kind of most of the cases, in general, it's nearly impossible to calculate for a general group, but then in special cases, you can calculate this invariance. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely rare that then they're not described by some kind of um, polytope. 
So kind mm. of this stuff about polytop and fibery things, it's, it's very nature, even mm. if you look at it from a group theoretic point of view. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I wanted to make the, the, this, this observation, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, actually, there is a link between the Thurston norm and right. sigma one. Uh -huh. Okay. Right. Um, actually, I, I expect some of the results should have analogous versions for it. For example, on um, free bicyclic groups, which are given by those, uh, what are they called? Absolutely reducible elements in outer FM or something. I think Kiel and wrote, yeah. Kiel wrote a paper about mm -hmm. the polytop that governs the situation of free bicyclic. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you've looked, right. and he links it with auto analytic numbers and other stuff. Right, I think there are some, pro uh, I mean, some ingredients should have no problem to be generalized, but but there are some other ingredients like uh, this Eagles uh, um, reverse criterion. I, th that's a part that I'm not sure if that's generalizable to the general situation. Um, but I expect, uh, where were you? Mm, like this theorem, that's a, yeah. Uh, I think that 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 would be the hardest part if we want. Okay, to I'm not sure I understand the language you're using because I approach it from a completely mm -hmm. different point of view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For example, let let us try to understand. I want to find a bridge between your language and my language. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in so, theorem, uh, sorry, uh, in fact, the theorem is uh, generalized already by Killer. Okay, so mm -hmm. is it on archive? Oh, no, it's in jumps already published. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, it's, a, it's like a, so if you find the generalization. But uh, it's about what a hyperbolic tree manifold or free by cycle? It's about uh, uh, this okay. RF, RFRS groups, subgroups. So the, the question is if they have L, uh, so uh, the, uh, you can ask when you have the fibering of RFRS groups, and uh, mm -hmm. so he gave a, okay, a criterion which generalizes a loss criteria. And fiber, yeah, and I, I think there is also a generalization group. Hmm. Right. I think there is also some generalization, so-called this uh, virtual specialization, for certain uh, free bicyclic groups that is done by on um, T skin wise. Groups, I think um, uh, that's a virtual specialization would be the hardest part to, to, to pass by. Right, so uh, any more questions or comments? Well, if not, I suggest to thank speaker again. <laughs>